Welcome everybody. This is a session on how to write a plain English summary, often referred to as just PES, for National Institute for Health Research or NIHR funding proposals. My name is Duncan Barron. I'm the Patient and Public Involvement Lead uh, at St George's University. Uh, we're lucky today to have Victoria Hamer here with us as well. Victoria. And I'm very pleased to be here and to be the Honorary Patient and Public Involvement PPI Fellow for the Centre for Applied Health and Social Care Research at Kingston University and also um, a patient advisory group member for the British Heart Foundation. So, Thanks, Victoria. So our aim today is to cover um, an introduction to what is a plain English summary from an NIHR perspective. And our intended audience is for research researchers who are expected to write a plain English summary as part of their funding proposal, but also to lay people, members of the public, people in PPI groups who've been asked to uh, co-write or help produce a plain English summary with a researcher. So that's the overarching group we're we're trying to uh, appeal to really. Um, this is a very informal session. We'd much rather be delivering this to you in person, but for ease, we thought we'd record this. So from a NIHR perspective, a plain English summary is intended for an interested audience who are not necess necessarily specialists in the field. Uh, the summary should be written at roughly the same level as a newspaper article. Oh, it's gone on too far. <laughs> OK, and uh, the plain English summary serves the general purpose of explaining research to the non-expert. A plain English summary is a brief summary of a research project or a research proposal that's been written for and with members of the public rather than just by researchers or professionals who may rely too much on technical language. Uh, it should be written in plain English, as the name suggests, and it should avoid the use of jargon and also help explain any technical terms that have to be included. From uh, an NIHR perspective, uh, the plain English summary is a requirement for funding. They actually state in their garden, guidance that they say, and the quote is, if we feel that your plain English summary is not clear and not of a good quality, then you may be required to amend your summary prior to funding, final funding approval. So before the money is actually released for the research, the plain English summary may need uh, amending from a plain English perspective. And did you also want to emphasise that the NIHR will no longer use the term of lay summary? It's always plain English summaries that they're talking about. Yes, that's right. Thank you. They used to use the term lay summary, so sometimes that's used interchangeably and other funders may actually still use lay summary, uh, but the NIHR have moved away from using lay summary and now just refer to plain English summary. So for other funders, maybe the MRC or Wellcome Trust, if they're if you've been asked to help with a lay summary, you could view that very similarly to, to a plain English summary. And some of this um, advice we're giving you today should be relevant to producing a lay summary too. So this slide uh, says, this is from the guidance um, from the NIHR, that a plain English summary is not the same as a scientific abstract. So a scientific abstract has to be included in a funding proposal, but, and it's also quite short and brief and summarizes the research in its entirety, but it's not enough to just cut and paste from your scientific abstract and paste that exactly the same into your plain English. Uh, that is not creating a good plain English summary. And they also suggest that it's helpful to involve patients, carers, service users, practitioners and members of the public in developing a plain English summary. So that uh, hopefully 
um, applies to many of you listening to or watching this recording. Hopefully you've been approached by a researcher to help with this um, with this uh, activity of producing a plain English summary. And also to do with the um, not um, having the same as a scientific abstract. Did you want to talk about how the researchers um, may need to be persuaded that they won't get marked down by changing to um, a plain English summary. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I think you've made it well, but uh, certainly the NHR stresses that it's, you know, it's not a dumbing down feature. So exactly what Victoria's just said, res researchers won't be marked down for a plain English summary, and there's still the opportunity to write the technical scientific summary later anyway. Thanks, Victoria. So plain English is not easy, but it's also not impossible either. Interestingly, um, most sections of a funding proposal will have word limits, word count limits, and that is true of the plain English summary section. But the NIHR, they have numerous funding streams, fellowships, research for patient benefit, I for I, lots of different ones, and some do vary in the number of words that are permitted for a plain English summary. Two examples are given here. The, the research for patient benefit funding stream allows 450 words for the plain English summary, whereas applying for a fellowship, a doctoral or a postdoctoral fellowship, has 600 words. So it's important that the researcher knows this, and if they're asking a lay group to help them, then it's it's useful for everybody to be aware of what word count they're working towards. So do do check that. Do chip in, Victoria, if you've got uh, something you no, want to add. That's, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think this this is my my party piece, which um, Duncan has put in when plain English isn't, and so this model leads to axial and peripheral new bone formation, which is not seen in soluble TNF overexpression models, indicating different pathogenic roles of soluble and transmembra transmembrane TNF in arthritis development. Besides TNF, the IL-23 stroke IL stroke 17 axis is emerging as an important inflammatory pathway. So that is very clear, isn't it? Now, the next slide is the benefit of PPI for language um, because um, PPI helps to simplify technical language and to explain um, acronyms so that people understand. And for instance, um, people won't understand what vertex is. Um, it'd be much easier to say um, top of your head. And um, also to encourage not to use the um, expression taking consent because um, Consent has to be given freely and can't be taken, but um, particularly that might be used um, to do with consent, but occasionally it might be needed in a PS, but not, not usually. Um, and a term which can seem um, disempowering to participants or potential participants um, is subjects. Um, people don't generally like to feel that they are subject to having something done to them and choose to be a participant. Um, and also, again, in um, plain English summaries, maybe refer to people as um, older people rather than elderly. Um, and as you can see in this slide, although I don't know in a plain English summary how you will actually manage to do this, um, an illustration can speak um, more than a thousand words, depending how many words you have. This one um, has been drawn by a child, but also the researcher could do um, a, a drawing to illustrate. And just to um, think about it again, to do with, it could be to do with plain English summaries, is um, children and young people, if there's research um, being done 
for young people, about young people, um, to consider using children and young people as patient and public involvement, maybe to help with the writing or certainly to help with the reviewing, because they can be so astute um, in thinking and querying practically every word in order to make sure that they had understood it and suggesting other words and phrases in order to help other young people understand. Um, when I've seen this, I've found it so impressive, their questioning, and the result was much clearer. Now, the next is top tips from Duncan. Thank you, Victoria. Yes, so um, this is some suggestions um, that the text should be written in an easily readable style. Um, that goes back to the sort of newspaper article level of writing, really. And always explain any medical or technical terms you have, uh, possibly using brackets. So, for example, uh, when this is written in endovascular aneurysm repair and in brackets EVAR. So every time that is referred to thereafter, EVAR, the abbreviation can be used and it's not necessary to use uh, the name in full. Be concise, use clear sentences broken up into clear paragraphs for readability and avoid complex grammatical structures where possible. And it's a good idea to use active verbs. In other words, we will do it rather than it will be done by us. Victoria, were you going to oh, speak to us? Yes. Um, top tips, more of them. Avoid complex or meaningless terms and phrases. Many terms used in academic English are either overcomplicated or contain no in useful information. Examples include terms such as virtually or literally or archaic language amidst whilst, as well as verb choices such as purchase used in place of the, of the simpler buy. Um, I personally would add intersectionality to that because I've always struggled to know exactly what's meant by that. So um, that's if you can avoid intersectionality, I'd be really pleased. OK, positive phrasing. Sentences should be phrased positively rather than negatively. For example, you will have repeat appointments at least once a fortnight rather than the usual practices not to schedule repeat appointments more frequently than once a fortnight. And when you're reading through, um, I would suggest if you have even the slightest doubt um, as you're reading a plain English summary, do please write it down and acknowledge, as it were, that you have had this doubt and think of ways to overcome and clarify that doubt. If you've had that even smidgen of doubt, other readers will have too. Now, yes. Duncan has more top tips. Yes, thank you. That was a good suggestion. Yes, bigger words are not always better, so try to use everyday words. Um, in limited text space, so we've already said that the plain English summary will have a limited word count, you may need to prioritise what goes in. And it's sometimes helpful to keep asking the question, which means until you cannot condense that um, sentence or that uh, bit of writing until you cannot condense it anymore. So keep on asking what which means until you've got it got direct to the meaning. It's quite a useful tool. So once you've written your plain English summary, obviously it's good to check for mistakes. Uh, ask a friend or colleague to read and tell you what they've just read. And if they don't understand it, or if they are reading it and they stumble over it because of meaning or complex words, then it might indicate you've got to rewrite it. Is it written sincerely and personally with the right tone of voice? And it's always good to check your writing and read aloud. And for, for the checking of the writing, um, I have an example. For instance, I had a stroke and I was alerted that I should 
since then um, treat everything as a draft to be checked. So I learned not to send anything important in the evening and, and I wait until I double check in the morning when my mind is fresh and I can spot any mistakes, which at night time I wouldn't have. Mm, now, yes, good Duncan, idea. Duncan mm -hmm. has stunning fog coming up. Yes, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but people might be aware of this or see it referred to. But this is a, a, a potentially a useful tool called Gunning Fog, and there's a there's a website here um, that you can access. And you cut and paste your text into the website, and it comes up with a readability score for you. So, in general, anything above a twelve score is too hard for most people to read. I won't go into the details of how it works, but um, there's an algorithm and it basically works out the, the length of the sentence. And the general advice, as you see here at the bottom of this slide, is to keep a good average sentence length, or ASL, average sentence length, to about 15 to 20 words. Or you even use shorter sentences for bigger punch. Um, longer sentences should not have more than three items of information. Uh, you, instead of gunning fog, you could also use um, the various tools within Word um, or Grammarly is also another tool. I just want to quickly move on to the NI, NIHR's own guidance of what to include in a plain English summary. There is a dedicated website for make it and it's called Make It Clear is the name of the guidance that the NIHR has written. These are the uh, these bullet points are the areas that they suggest, and it is only suggestions. It's only guidance. Uh, they suggest that these headings or subheadings go into a plain English summary. I've often seen uh, where word counts uh, are tight that the plain English summary is written with these subheadings and then taken away. Uh, to so that you can actually gain from having these extra words within the body of the text. I think the most important thing is that your plain English summary or the one that you're looking at or helping with contains each of these bits of information. Now there is a contentious point right at the beginning in that the ordering of these bullet points is possibly not in the correct order. And I've seen it come back from the NIHR that actually they would like the background to the research to come before aims of the research. So that's fairly straightforward to um, to amend. Uh, so background, then aims, design and methods used. Then they want a separate section on briefly on patient and public involvement, this thing that you might be helping uh, with the plain English summary, uh, and then dissemination. Here in a bit more depth or a bit more detail is further guidance on what to include in each of those sections with additional bullet points on the uh, right hand side of this screen. So I won't go into that in any great depth, but if you wanted to just look at if you've been asked from a lay perspective to help write, you might want to look at what is meant to be going into these sections so that you can see and help the researcher and advise them whether they actually have covered these points. Another good thing to look at is how will the plain English summary be assessed by the NIHR funding panel? Now, as we've seen earlier, it is a requirement for funding and each member of the funding panel will review the plain English summary and two lay people will review it. And this is the guidance that the lay reviewers are asked to use to assess the standard of the plain English summary. So, for example, did the plain English give a clear explanation of the research? Did it help you carry out your review? If not, why not? Was the language used appropriate? Were the scientific terms and jargon, et cetera, explained? If not, which terms need ex explanation? So that's, again, might be useful, particularly for a lay person helping write a plain English summary for you to look at to see uh, what questions are going to be asked on the final version of the plain English summary when it's submitted. For those of you even more interested in learning more about how to review a, a plain English summary from a lay perspective, there is some interactive training available that the NIHR has put together. 
Uh, there's a, a hyperlink on the right hand side of this uh, slide and I've tried to summarize in detail what uh, what is contained within each section of the plain, plain English reviewers guidance. So I'm not going to go into that in any great detail here, but if you want to look at the NIHR's interactive training, it's it's free, it's accessible to everybody, and it might be of interest to you. Other resources, and we have um, utilised some of this information in these slides today, uh, the plain English, how to write plain English from a, a medical information point of view. So we've we've added some of that and the uh, link is here. So thanks for listening. Um, it's a very informal uh, session today, but if you've got any follow up questions, do please drop me a line on this email address. We do hope to have a follow up session uh, recording that can that will be uh, will have researchers contribute to that session and the remaining slides on the presentation today which you will be sent they contain some examples from researchers who've amended their plain english draft after they've had input from lay people so there's an example here from aurelian who's a doctor doing abdominal aortic aneurysm research. And if you look at the slide, I've highlighted in yellow some of the technical terms in his first draft. He's amended in his later draft. So for example, dilation, he's amended after the lay people reviewed it to swelling. There's some other examples in there as well. Um, for example, also including numbers. There's no need to use numbers as a form of referencing. So in this example in the first draft, the number two is in brackets and it's a way of in a formal scientific writing of um, doing footnotes. So you reference that point you're making. You don't put bullet notes or footnotes or references in a plain English summary. Uh, there's another example here on this slide, further highlights in yellow of what changed from the first draft to how it was simplified for a lay audience in the second draft. So these are just examples for you to look at that may help you. I've asked another um, uh, researcher as well, Hai Ting. He's looking at heart failure and artificial intelligence research. He's got a fairly brief example here. He uses uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy which he then later throughout the draft just uses. He uses that in full at first and then uses CRT pacemaker thereon. So that's quite a good example. OK, so that's the session over with for now. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. We hope that's uh, been of use to you and uh, we will be following it up hopefully in the near future with the contributions from the researchers so thanks ever so much for paying attention today and thanks to victoria thank you super so let me start by introducing uh, as part of this plain english summary workshop session uh, we wanted to focus on some worked examples of writing a plain english summary and uh, today we've got Mr. Aurelian Guru here, a researcher in abdominal aortic aneurysm research. And Aurelian is going to just introduce us to his research and then take us through some of the uh, lessons he's learned by picking out some examples from a recent plain English summary he wrote with input from some lay people. So Aurelian, over to you. Thanks very much for having me, Duncan. Um, so my research um, is looking at a um, advanced stent technology for uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, vascular surgery, which is my specialty, is a very technical specialty. And even in that very short, plain English sentence, you'll have heard some terms of jargon. It's very difficult for me as an academic clinician, but I think especially in vascular surgery to avoid jargon. Um, and some words that you might take as a given actually need some explanation. For example, stents, not everyone will know what 
a stent means and the stents I look at are very specialized and unlike most of the stents people will picture. Um, so that's what I do and I look at the um, clinical outcomes, so mortality, reoperation for this um, very specialized type of stent. Brilliant, thank you. So on the screen at the moment we have um, some examples, uh, this, this slide and the following of a couple of drafts that you made uh, of your plain English. So on the on the left of the screen is an earlier draft, the first draft, and then you, I believe you had some input from lay people and they made some suggestions about uh, what you could change. So are you able to just um, pick up on some of the examples you've highlighted here for us? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you can see in my first attempt, um, the ways I'm trying to define those very technical words um, you know this is aneurysm research and obviously in vascular surgery everyone knows what aneurysm is but that needs explanation and um, I've gone for dilation in my first draft again thinking this is a common term but um, reframing it um, I've described it in sort of plainer English in terms of a swelling um, of the um, main artery in the abdomen, which is our um, plain English definition of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And then one of the key things which I got from feedback is, as I mentioned, I'm looking at clinical outcomes, especially mortality and reoperation, which are complications and death following this um operation but we as doctors and vascular surgeons especially we deal you know with very ill patients very often we deal with very serious conditions and although the mortality rate is low after these operations that it exists they are quite high risk and in medical terms actually reasonably high you know one percent is high for us so um i couldn't avoid talking about mortality talking about complications as part of this research because that's the whole object of it and clearly as you can see from my first draft i haven't really shied away from it because that's what you do in scientific abstracts you state things as clearly as you can which is you know it's not unclear in the second draft but the focus has changed so in the first draft we're talking about rupture of aneurysms and um, we're talking about death rates we're talking about internal bleeding which is sort of the reality of vascular surgery which is uh, yeah you know quite bloody i guess mm. um and surgical and just the way things have been reframed i think very interesting mentality shift for me uh, so again we've uh, changed the word rupture to make it more accessible so a rupture just means bursting of the aneurysm and it didn't need the extra line about internal bleeding is kind of obvious i guess it when what happens when a vessel bursts so that was removed because it you know it was um that that sort of uh, language can lead to anxiety and distress and just wasn't really necessary so that was removed and then again rather than focusing on death you can easily flip that on survival and actually this doesn't dilute the message at all because my mortality graphs are actually expressed as survival after the operation so yes you could talk about the same graft as a mortality rate but it, it's not wrong it's not unclear to say actually the survival rate following this operation is such at five years so that sort of mentality shift is clear in that second draft in terms of chance of survival, 
And also when we're talking about reoperations, rather than talking about reoperation rates, we talked about freedom from reintervention, which is exactly analogous or the same as um, the relationship between mortality and survival. So those are the some some of the um, points to highlight from this comparison between drafts. Right. And and am I right in thinking that some of the comments that you received, uh, particularly from the lay feedback, was the the starkness potentially of the the mention of death and internal bleeding, and and rather than I know you need to mention it. Uh, it because it's unavoidable in your area of research, but making it less, um, I don't know, worrisome, I guess, for the for the member of the public reading it potentially. Is that fair, do you think? Um, I think it depends on your patient group. And um, although this hasn't really been reviewed by people with aneurysms yet, mm -hmm. um, it came out from people with experience with PPIE. We did send it to some patients, but they were patients with also quite serious conditions with, you know, potentially terminal illnesses, not immediately, but, you know, serious conditions. It was a CKD group, so hemodialysis, complications, all this sort of thing. So I think for a group like that, they're aware about death, so they didn't mention it so much. But, you know, in a, and you might think that in aneurysm group also, um, they might be less sensitive to the mention of death. I think it's stuff like bleeding, really, sort of or like, you know, I think probably in the original scientific abstract, it's uh, something like secondary to hemorrhage, which is even worse, mm. potentially to internal bleeding, even though they mean the same. Mm. So I think it's the, the feedback, I think, was very interesting about um, just being careful with the words you choose. And even though some people it, it may not be so stark to them or so distressing to others. It may well be, even in those high risk groups who are aware of those things. Even if you're aware, I don't think you want to be confronted by it, especially if it's a research study rather than a clinical uh, rather than a, a clinical experience like an appointment or or before surgery. So because the environment is different, I don't think there's no need to confront people with terms like that that could potentially distress them or cause them anxiety, especially if their operation has gone well and they're asymptomatic and doing really well. So um, so I think those are the important things. Great. That's really helpful. We have a, a number highlighted here, and I, number two at the bottom, but I think equally number one earlier possibly could have highlighted. And I'm assuming that's the, the. it's just not necessary. I think these are relate to probably references, do they? And they're just not yeah. necessary in a plain English summary. Is that fair? I th yeah, exactly. I think that's a really good point. Um, unless perhaps you're referencing um, like a patient information sheet, or, but you can do that easily with a link that you could embed if it's a digital resource or your link at the end but yeah that was a really good point and came out of the feedback um that um you know you just don't need the references and these will have probably been scientific references as well so it's not really necessary right i think we've got another example i can move on to between a before and after, and I don't know if you don't have to go through all of these points if you don't want to, but if you've got uh, something you want to just highlight from from these examples. Yeah, I think this um, highlights what I've mentioned already in terms of talking about equivalent, um, talking about higher reoperation rates and uh, equivalent mortality rates. You can see that's changed to require on average more reoperations, but we could equally have changed that to say um, they uh, do not require on average more reoperations. 
uh, oh, sorry, uh, people with open surgery do not require on average more reoperations or their, their freedom from reoperation is, is less with the stent technology. And again, mortality rates has changed the survival rates. Again, you can see some of the jargon creeping in or formal English, like um, a keyhole incision affords rather than allows much lower operative risks and contemporary data is incredibly formal and scientific and that's changed to requires on average which makes a lot more sense really in plain English. Yeah thank you that's great. So uh, do you have any other reflections that uh, you can share for us now uh, just on your experiences of putting together a plain English summary really? Well I think the um, the 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 process that I was lucky to be involved in was very much an iterative process and lots of different perspectives. And of course, when you have an iterative process of revising drafts several times with several people looking at drafts, that takes time. There is a back and forth with different drafts, different suggestions how to potentially incorporate conflicting advice or uh, suggestions. But I think the strength of a good um, plain English summary is that it does include different perspectives and patients will have different perspective from lay individuals with experience in PPIE. And so to be able to um, include all those different perspectives, I think really strengthens uh, a plain English summary. So because you have that back and forth, I'd advise to start early because it does take time to incorporate all the suggestions, send it back out, receive new drafts. And again, this sort of multidisciplinary, multi-perspective aspect of it, try and include um, I don't think uh, an absolute number is necessarily something important because otherwise the iterative process gets a bit out of hand if you have 30 people sending you drafts. But um, but having a variety of people with different perspectives. So we had patients and PPI experts um and their suggestions were different and they had different um ideas concerns expectations from a plain english summary so those are the key things we're also incredibly lucky at st george's to have you duncan um you. Uh, you know you've been amazing throughout this process and i'm hoping to work with you closely on um some sort of formal PPIE structure for my research. And so to, to your group, I want to say that we are incredibly lucky at St George's and other higher instit um, education institutions will have, um, will have PPI experts like you. And that is a really invaluable um, resource and contact to have, and they can really help you to design a strategy um, to refine your approach and to uh, implement it as well. And that's a thing for total beginners like me who didn't have much experience. One thing we did do together and on your suggestion and thanks to um, the researcher who allowed me to do this, who I think might be involved in this seminar as well, but um, it, it was really useful when you're completely new to the process to observe someone who might be a bit further along to um, to see how they conduct a PPIE uh, activity. And uh, the, what I observed was a um, uh, sort of consultation group about the research, just to see how to facilitate that sort of activity. Um, and also it can potentially be a way obviously with um, uh, participants consent to involve them in some of your PPIE activities and again that's such an invaluable resource that we have at St George's that things are happening 
and similar to other universities um, with clinical research, such strong links to clinical research to be able to um, benefit from all the incredible um, PPI um, engagement activities that are happening. So I would really recommend that to people. But again, if you start early, it gives you the time to organize this sort of thing. Um, in fact, we could probably have started earlier for the deadlines we had to meet. But um, but yes, those are those are the key things I would say. Great, that's really helpful. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for helping today and thanks for your insights into your experience and your reflections. Really, really helpful. Thanks, Aurelian. Thanks very much, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. OK, well, welcome to the continuation of the Plain English Summary training workshop. Uh, this is an online session. We've moved from the uh, training sessions to getting some examples from a couple of researchers at based at St George's who've had recent experience of writing a plain English summary, having had some lay input. Um, so we now have, we move on to uh, Dr Ella Tumulty. Uh, from St George's and she's just going to introduce her area of research and her study and I shall bring up the slides while she's doing that. Ella over to you. Perfect thanks Duncan. Um, so like Duncan said I work at St George's um, and have been doing some research this year in particular into the area of patients that have heart disease and also chronic kidney disease. Um, and the particular research project I've been working on is um, designing a project for these patients who have quite frequent hospital admissions to try and use a device, which is like a pump device, to administer some of the medicines like frozamide, which they would normally have to come into hospital to receive through this pump device, which they could receive at home um, with the sort of rationale of keeping patients, if possible, out of hospital and sort of improve their quality of life and also reduce reduce their exposure to being in hospital and picking up things like infections. Um, so we had quite extensive PPI input into this project because obviously we the whole rationale is sort of um, in theory to it's what patients would ideally want was our hypothesis I guess we wanted to make sure that patients would actually be welcome to this idea and um, and that it would work for them and how they felt about using the pump and things. Um, and then we also had some patients who very kindly helped us to write our plain English summary. And I'm just going to talk through a few examples. Um, and it was really useful to have that input, especially when you've been working on a project like this for quite some time um, and have read it so many times yourself after writing it. Um, I think you become a bit uh, ignorant of the things which do, do, might not make sense for someone who's reading it for the first time. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few specific examples. Um, so I'm just going to so read out the first part of the plain English summary. So it says that fluid buildup is a common problem in heart failure. When this happens, tablets, fluid removal medication, frozamide, can become less effective. Patients often require admission to hospital to receive frozamide through a drip intravenously. Hospital admissions to treat fluid buildup are even more common in heart failure patients who also have kidney disease. Um, and then we'd written that hospital admissions are associated with risks and reduce quality of life. Um, and one of the patients picked up that it wasn't very clear what was meant by risks and um, they didn't understand what we meant by risks. Um, so then on our second draft, we changed this to that hospital admissions are disruptive for the patient and can lead to reduced quality of life as well as other risks. I'll just move that one on. Perfect, thank you. Um, and so we wrote that this study will assess if it is possible to treat fluid buildup in patients with heart failure and kidney disease at home using a wearable pump delivering frozamide under their skin. And we said that there were uncertainties which will be addressed in this small study before we plan a larger study across the UK, um, which was 
trying to describe, I guess, that this is a feasibility study. Um, but patients fed back that if they saw this in the plain English summary, that there were sort of uncertainties in this project, that they might be less inclined to take part unless we explained what they were and that it didn't really make it clear what these uncertainties were. Um, so we changed this to make it more clear what our feasibility outcome of this small study would be. Um, so we changed it to saying this, um, we want to make sure that the home treatment is acceptable to patients before we plan a larger study across the UK. So just making it a bit more clear what the uncertainties actually are, which needed addressing in this feasibility study. Thank you. Moving that one on again. Um, and then this is just a small example, um, but we'd written that this study, because there's two stages of the study we were designing, and there, there were lots of examples like this through the plain English summary, but I just sort of picked up on this one. And we'd said thing, we said in this part that it would run in parallel to the first stage, whereas we had feedback that would make it more accessible and easier to read if we said it would run alongside the first stage. Um, so there were lots of examples like this I could have picked up. This is just one example. Um, and then, so we had written that patients will monitor their blood pressure and weight and receive a daily check-in call from the research team. Um, I said that we would check patients' potassium levels on days two and four and provide supplements as needed. Um, and patients, a few different patients uh, wanted to know about this when it said that we that they would check, monitor their blood pressure and weight at home. Um, a few different patients wanted to know sort of would that be equipment that they would be expected to have or would that be equipment provided by the research team? Um, and one patient as well wanted to know about why the potassium would be checked. So we changed it to make it clear that the uh, blood pressure and weighing scales would be provided by the research team and also added a little um, sentence explaining that furosemide can affect potassium levels and that's why we've been monitoring it on days two and four. Um, so there are lots more other examples which I could have showed, but I thought these were quite good um, demonstrations of how just simple changes to the plain English summary uh, suggested by the patients did really improve it overall in our final draft. Um, and so I guess on final reflections and points, if you're writing a plain English summary would be to start early um, and to get as many people as possible to read it. Because um, like I said, things that will seem quite obvious to you as the writer after, if, if especially if it's your idea and you've written it and redrafted it so many times, um, but other people in a fresh pair of eyes um, can be really helpful. And especially when it is the patients who are affected by the research that you're doing, um, they'll provide really unique perspectives, which can be very helpful. Um, and then also I use something called the Gun in Fog Index, which you can, which is available online, which again um, shows a sort of readability score of your sentences um, and just trying to make sort of your sentences as short and succinct and easy to read as possible. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got to say, but thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Ella. That's really helpful. So, um... Apologies, my video isn't working, but I, it's Duncan Barron here, PPI lead uh, at IMBI at St George's. Do watch this video in uh, collaboration with the workshop that we've put together and the other example um, from a St George's researcher, which is also available online. Thanks very much.